Welcome to the Wednesday Night Bible Study. Come on, let's give God some praise. It is Wednesday Night Bible Study. Come on, let's give God some praise. Give Him praise, give Him praise, give Him praise. He is worthy to be praised. He is the Alpha, He is the Omega, He is the beginning and the end. Who is like our God? Come on, church, give God some praise. Give Him praise. Hallelujah. Are you ready for the Bible study this evening? Yes. Let's bow down our heads and let's pray. Father, we honor you tonight. We bless you for the grace that we have to come before you to sit at your feet and to feed at your table. We bless you for the word of life that you have given unto us, leading us to eternal life, giving us sustenance, giving us life in abundance, wisdom to sustain us through the troubles of life. So we are grateful that we have access to the light that shines on our path, that we will not walk in darkness. So right here, right now, pour out your spirit upon us all, upon all flesh that we might receive. Give me divine grace to speak with clarity. Let the utterances come forth with power, uninterrupted with any kind of satanic forces. Endow your people with divine understanding, and do not allow the birds of evil to pick up these words away from their heart. Rather, do what only you can do in this place. Set somebody free from the bondage of evil tonight. Set somebody free from sickness and disease tonight. Let your light shine like we have never seen it before. We give you praise and we give you all the glory. Bless us and let us have it as you have planned it for us. In Jesus' name, somebody shout a good amen. Hallelujah. Amen and amen and amen. Tell your neighbor, welcome to Bible study. Welcome to Bible study. Amen and amen. It's a beautiful week. <clears throat> As we are going through what would the church call the Passion Week, getting ourselves ready to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus the memory of such beautiful moments that lingers on in our lives, that manifests us into the new position that we are today according to the will of God, that has given us grace. Somebody shout grace. Glory be to God. So we are ready to celebrate the memory and to give God the praise and give him thanks that by the power of his resurrection we have received abundant life and set free from the bondage of sin. That's why it's not by coincidence or accident it was never unplanned that we are currently at this moment speaking about grace. Grace. The unmerited favor that sets man from the power of free from the power of the law. The unmerited favor that draws the unqualified unto God. Unmerited favor that sets you and I free from the consequences of sin. Grace. It's grace. We have all sinned and fall short. But grace, 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 grace. So we started looking at grace. We said it's not just that which pertains to sin and set us free from the power of the law and the consequences of the sin. But actually we need grace for life. Pertaining to life, we need grace. Pertaining to godliness, we need grace. In relationship with man, we need grace. Relationship with God, we need grace. And that was why we said, if there's no doubt about it in my mind, that grace is the favor that opens the door that no man can shut. We talked about that last week. That grace is the favor that puts you in the position you are not qualified for. It's called grace. 
That grace is the favor that puts you in places that you have no right being there. My God. That was grace. But that point is, it's difficult for us to embrace grace as far as we continue to live in the consciousness of sin. As far as we continue to live under the bondage of the law. And I asked that question last week. Because people think we can abuse grace. The people that says you are abusing grace are completely engraved in the chains on the tablets of the law. They can't get their head off it. Saved but not saved. They will ever forever wanting to be judged you and I as a result of the freedom in which we are walking in. So they will say you are abusing grace. And the question last week was do you ever think it's right to blame sin on grace? Or say the other way, do you think it's right to blame grace for sin? Oh, you go to that church, they are sinning. Because the only thing their pastor preaches is grace. Paul went through that. That he asked to ask this question. The same question I'm asking in a different way. I'm asking you the question. Do you think it's right to blame grace for your sin? I want to show you today, no, that you can't do that. You can't blame grace for your sin. Why? Let me make it clear to you. Grace is made available for your sin. Let, let, let's look at it this way. Panadol was formulated put together pharmaceutically to become a pain reliever so that when you have headache you take Panadol the longer the headache goes the longer you're going to take Panadol so if you go to the doctor the doctor will say okay you're going to take two Panadol Three times a day for 10 days. And then it will go, if you ever have an headache in the between, take as needed. <laughs> oh, I love that. When, when they write it, I say, take as needed. Now, you want me to now blame the Panadol for my headache. Oh, look at me. What oh, is my God? My God, I'm having a headache. It's because of Panadol. No, idiot. It is not. Panadol is to relieve you of your headache. So it's grace. Help me tell every religious people near and sitting near to you. Grace is available to take care of sin. Just like Panadol is available to take care of your headache. The church has never stopped to talk about do's and don'ts, do's and don'ts, do's and don'ts. But we concluded up to last week that nothing you can do that will make you right with God. There is no work. There is no amount of tithe you give. There is no amount of how holy you think you are that can make you right with God. Jesus, my God. Jesus made you right.
with God. So today, what are we going to be dealing with today? Last week, I kind of quickly point you to a scripture. As I said, it's time for us to define sin. Because if you really want to set yourself free from this thing called sin, the only reason you hear me talking about sin in this church is because I'm teaching grace. And I'm teaching grace for you to know that everywhere that sin wants to raise its head, that grace will raise its head. That grace is available. That's what I want, I'm teaching. You say, Pastor, all this grace preacher, I don't know where they get it from. They just want to be, they just want to cover their sin. They just, yes, it's true. Maybe I, I want to cover my sin, but let me tell you the truth. My sin is covered. That's the point. So that's why I don't preach sin in this church. I preach grace. But in the next two Bible studies, I want to talk to you about sin. Not from the position of the people who want you to be afraid, but from the position of grace, so that you can be free. So the big question we're going to start with today is to answer the question, which sin is not to death? We started defining sin from the Bible. Last week, I just dropped it. So I want to take it from there. Which sin? That's the thing we are dealing with today. If grace is going to have power, you must understand this. Which sin is not unto death? So let us start looking at the scripture. Okay? We start with 1 John chapter 5. Verse 17. That's where we want to start today. And I want to read three different versions. Okay? I want to read three different versions. I want to read King James Version. I want to read New Living Translation. And I want to read Contemporary English Version or NIV. I'll take one of them because they are literally about the same. Alright? So, so, let's see if we can get this done. First John chapter 5 verse 17 if you come with me we're going to start with king james version the question is what is sin last week that was the question what is sin and we answered it from this scripture it says all unrighteousness pay attention to the grammar please pay attention to all the detail of the grammar in this sentence. All sin, what is it? All unrighteousness is. Not all unrighteousness are. All unrighteousness, one word, is sin. All unrighteousness, righteousness, one word, is sin, even though the word all was used, unrighteousness is sin. So there is no small sin, there is no big sin, there is no large sin, there is no great sin. So even when you are looking at 613 laws, there is not one of it that is bigger than the other. It's put together as unrighteousness. And then he went further and said, and there is a sin not unto death. That's the question I want to answer today. What, which sin is not unto death? King James said, all unrighteousness, and I told you last week, unrighteousness is not to be right with God. Unrighteousness is not to be right with God. And now, let's look at it from, uh, so, all unrighteousness is said in King James. 
So let's look at 1 John 5, 17 NIV this time, okay? Let's, let's, let's take it from there. It says, all wrongdoing, all wrongdoing is sin. And there is sin that does not lead to death. All wrongdoing. Now, remember, King James said all unrighteousness. NIV said wrong doing and I want you to remember the tree in the garden when God says the knowledge of good and evil that gives you the consciousness to know when you are wrong or you are right and when you do what is wrong is called wrong doing King James call it unrighteousness. NIV say it's wrongdoing. All wrongdoing is sin. And he said, and there is sin that does not lead to death. The question I'm going to ask you and you I to look at tonight is so what is that sin that does not lead to death? And what sin leads to death? Let's look at and uh, New Living Translation. New Living Translation used something that is so profound. And, and, and it says, let's, let's look at that. New Living Translation, 1 John chapter 5, verse 17. New Living Translation says, All wicked actions. All wicked actions. Now, take a look at that grammar. All wicked actions. Put together is sin. Not a, uh, but but he said all wicked actions are sin, but not every sin leads to death. All wicked actions are sin. Now pay attention to this. One of the things that God said he saw after Adam is outside of the garden and he looked at the man he created. And everything that's coming out of Adam. <laughs> everything that's connected to human race. Not goats. Not lamb. Not snakes. Not lions. Man. He looked at man. And said, and said he regret making man. For what? Wickedness. For all. That he has in his heart. Is wicked. So, but not every sin leads to death. Which sin doesn't lead to death? Now, let me put, let me put my, my chart on the screen for a second. Let's put chart number one on, this, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the screen. Definition of sin and its classification. We're going to deal with definition. So, he said, all unrighteousness, all wrongdoings, all wicked action, whatever fits into this definition, this word, is sin. All of them together is sin. Now, if you then look at that, this big word, you see that? So you use the word is on that chart. Is. So it's a one thing. Build together that is called sin. And that thing that's called sin is everything that's unrighteous. Everything. Uh, anything that God looks at that is not right with him. It is not your, what you look at. It's not what I look at. It is not your standard. It is not my standard. Is sin. Now put my second chart up. Please. The big word sin. Yes, put that up. Thank you. Now, when you look at this chart, you see the big word sin is unrighteousness. But it's splitted into two. 
One is death. The other one is no death. There is sin that produces death. And there's another one that doesn't produce death. That's where I want to talk today. What is the difference between the sin that leads to death and the sin that doesn't lead to death? Which one is which? Aha! Uh -huh. I want you to come with me to Genesis chapter 2 verse 17. Let's focus on the sin that leads to death. Let's focus on the sin that leads to death. Genesis chapter 2 verse 17. All right? Are you with me? Remember that's where we were last week. Let's go back there. Genesis 2 17. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. And we will read from New Living Translation, Genesis 2, 17. Uh, and, and actually, let's look from verse 16. But the Lord God, put it up, but the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat his fruit, it didn't say if you eat his leaves, it didn't say if you eat his roots, it didn't say if you eat his bark, it didn't say if you eat the branches, it didn't say if you eat the seed, it said if you eat the fruit. If you eat the fruit, you are sure to die. So when man ate the fruit, man died. The sin that led to death came from eating the fruit. So what did the fruit do? The fruit put the man in the place where he will now have to depend on himself. Remember this. When he, this fruit, the moment you eat it, the tree produced the fruit. That tree produced the fruit. The fruit that you ate is what led to the death. Now, what does that mean? It means man ate the fruit and he was able to start to know the difference between good and evil and the decision and choices that he makes from there becomes his responsibility. The fruit of his action is now leading to death because every day every time he wakes up he has no capacity to make the right decision he is now separated completely from god dependency and because he's no more depending on god and enjoying the freedom of everything right now he's living in everything wrong that is the death Death here means separated completely from God. Not having the life of the freedom that God gave to man when man was created. Death. It means you die completely from having the access to God's support. You are now on your own. The sin that leads to death is sin against God. It's the sin. Pay attention. Pay attention. Don't get it twisted. It's the sin against God. Why? Because you shifted 
from depending on God to depending on yourself. Can I go a little bit deeper? All right. That then means if you are separated from God, you die. It simply means you have moved from the place of God dependency to self-dependency. And therefore, the real true sin here is the sin of unbelief. Because the real reward of believing is depending on God. So, every time you see the fruit of unbelief, it produces death. You, 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 you might want to think a little bit and understand what I'm saying. What is the sin that leads to death? Sin against God. Jesus wanted to explain it. The sin that leads to death. Jesus was looking for a way to explain it. To those who are already operating in the sin that doesn't lead to death, but are guilt of the sin that leads to death. Oh, Shagun, don't get people confused. I don't want to confuse you. Jesus, I'm about to open a scripture, but I want to give you context. Jesus was talking to the Pharisees. The Pharisees, watch this, watch this. The Pharisees were human beings. They were descendants and they have the genetics of Adam. So they still bear the sin that leads to death. Now, through Abraham, God brought them into a family of ease. Just as part of the dispensation. They are still dead. But God, through Abraham, have them as his own people. So he gave them laws. And so the sin of Adam, of which they are still guilty of, leads to death. And they are now living under another kind of dispensation in which they have to daily watch what they do and they have to sacrifice for what they have done. And Jesus is now about to tell them that though, though even you still have this mercy that's holding you for the time of grace, you got to be careful. He told them, he said, you got to be careful because you have to understand that what you are living with under mercy right now is sin that doesn't lead to death. But there is a sin that leads to death. He was trying to explain that to them. Check this, Matthew 12. Let's look at Matthew chapter 12. I'm going to dig it down. I'm going to dig it down. Sin that leads to death is sin against God. Remember that. And I'm still breaking it down. Matthew 12. Hallelujah. And I want to read from verses 31 to 32. If you don't mind, I'll do that. So, Jesus said, in verse 31, New Living Translation, chapter 12 of Matthew, so I tell you, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy can be forgiven. Except, you see, he's now splitting sin into two categories. Like we saw the big sin that 
was in 1 John chapter 5, verse 17. Jesus is now breaking it down. He says, I tell you every sin and blasphemy can be forgiven. He said, except blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which will never, can I hear an amen, be forgiven. Which will never be forgiven. Which will never be forgiven. Listen to verse 32 because I'm going somewhere. He said, anyone who speaks against the Son of Man, that's God. If you speak against the Son of Man, listen carefully. Son of Man, man, can be forgiven. If you speak against the Son of Man, this is deep. It's deep. This is Jesus, the Son of God, now saying, if you speak against me, son of man, you will be forgiven. He said, but for everyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit, I want you to know that the only thing that connected Adam to God was God's Spirit. The only thing that connected man to God is God's own spirit. It is that which gives you the privilege to depend on God. Am I, am I, am I, are, you, are you clear? He said, when you sin against the Holy Spirit, if you sin against the Son of Man, it will lead to death, meaning you can be forgiven. He said, but if you sin against the Holy Spirit. He says, that means you cannot be forgiven. You die forever. He said, you speak against the Holy Spirit, you will never be forgiven, either in this world or in the world to come. What does that mean? It means the sin that leads to death has no any headly sacrifice that can atone for it. The sin that leads to death, there is no sacrifice on earth that can atone for it. Let me show you in Hebrews chapter 6 so you understand that now that you are a believer, that you understand that when I start to talk about sin that leads to death, if you are already saved, you, you have been brought from death to life. The sin against God by Adam of which you and I become guilty of. I'm going to get to all of this. I'm going to get to them. You have to understand that the blood of Jesus was the only one that could atone for that. But the real true meaning of that sin is unbelief. God said to Adam, don't do that. See that tree? Will get you in trouble. You can eat from all of these trees, but that one, if you eat it, it will get you in trouble. When the devil came in, he told him, No, he won't. Who did he believe? He doesn't, he doesn't understand, he doesn't have the consciousness of good or bad. But that devil gave him the fruit to eat just by telling him or her or them what God told you is not true. Who do you believe? He believed the devil. She believed the devil. 
They believed the devil. That was what they ate. Unbelief is the problem. It's a big, big sin of Adam. He was not against anything. He just walked in unbelief. And he automatically became self-dependent, rejected God, <laughs> and eventually come into the place of death. I know you are not Adam. Look at Hebrews 6. Please, let's, let's get to this. Hebrews chapter 6. Let's read from verses 4 to 6. Hebrews chapter 6 and we'll read from verse 4 to verse 6. I want to read from verse 4. Look at what it says. It's, look at this. I want you to pay attention to this. This is for the unbelievers. And I know this scripture has been giving a lot of people a lot of trouble. But listen to this. Listen to this. You, you will enjoy it in a minute. Hallelujah. All right. So, for it is impossible. Pay, pay attention to this. It is impossible to bring back to repentance. Those who were once enlightened, those who have experienced the good things of heaven and shared in the Holy Spirit, Listen carefully. Who have tested the goodness of the word of God and the power of the age to come? And who then turn away from God? It is impossible to bring such people back to repentance by rejecting the Son of God. They themselves are kneeling into the cross once again, and holding him up to public shame. This is what the church will tell you. It's called apostasy. It's called denying the faith. It's called falling away. But let's take this scripture and read it to understanding. He said, it is impossible to bring back someone to repentance, to say, tell somebody to repent. After they have tested, after they have been saved, put it in a simple way, and they decide not to be saved again. <laughs> That's why he's saying, but can you understand what he's really truly saying? He's saying it is impossible for someone to be saved and fall away. That's what he's saying. He said literally impossible. He said because it is impossible for someone who is saved to be unsaved because you won't be able to save him. <laughs> if someone is saved and is unsaved, it will be impossible for you to save that person. That's all he's trying to say here. Why? Because it was trying to speak to them. To give up. To give up. All the practices of the law and all the old things they've always known to focus on Jesus. He said, because the moment you focus on Jesus, it's impossible for you to be unsaved. Unbelief is something that is so powerful. It's the sin that leads to death. You know, when God gave the children of Moses the law, I'm going to come to that. The first thing he said to them is, you will know me as God. <laughs> because that was, the that, that was what he wanted Adam to be. Know him 
to depend on him. So when he gave them that law, in these 613 laws, this you will know me as God in the Moses, uh, in the law of Moses for the children of Israel, you will know me as law, um, as God was broken to about 18 pieces. 18 of the 613. The first thing he told them is you must know me as God and don't have any other God. What is he saying? Depend on me. Depend on me. Just trust me. I'm good enough. Why is grace not good enough for this church? When all you need is grace. If you look at Hebrews chapter 3 verse 17. Let's go, let's stay there. Hebrews 3, 17. Let's quickly look at that. And I want to, uh, um, I want to read all the way to 19. So he was dealing with the children of Israel. We read from verse 17, New Living Translation. And who made God angry for 40 years? Talking of the children of Israel after God took them out of Egypt. Was it, it, wasn't it the people who sinned? Whose corpses lay in the wilderness? And to whom was God speaking when he took an oath that they would not enter his rest? Wasn't it the people who disobeyed him? What kind of disobedience? So we see that because of their unbelief, they were not able to enter his rest. This is serious. We are still talking about death that leads to, of a sin that is leading to death. Unbelief is what Adam and Eve committed. Wanting to be self-dependent. Which, when you look at what God was trying to do with the children of Israel, what children of Israel was wanting to be self-righteous. Adam wants to be self-dependent. The Pharisees that Jesus had a trouble with when he was walking on the surface of the earth, they want to be self-righteous. See my walk. That's why I'm right with God. I pay my time. That's why I'm right with God. Because you cannot be right with God if you have been found guilty of the sin of unbelief. <laughs> why? Because it takes the blood of Jesus to cleanse you. And that blood releases you into grace. And that grace makes you self, I mean, made you God dependent and not self dependent. So put my thing up again. Put it up. Shot number two, the big sin or the big word sin. Put it up. The second one is the sin that leads to no death. You see? No death. I know. That Romans chapter 6 verse 23 said that the consequences of sin is death. So when the writer of John now said to us, there is a sin that leads to death and there is one that doesn't lead to death. So we need to then find out which sin does not lead to death. Put it up there again. The sin that leads to death is sin against God. Let me submit to you that the sin that does not lead to death is the sin against the law. Sin that leads to death is the sin against God. Sin that does not lead to death is the sin against the law. What does that mean? 
Everything that is not right is sin with God. But the one that leads to sin, to death is the one that sin against God's own standard. But when it comes to the law, the law is set to cover three areas. Man to man, man to God, and man to the society. So the law becomes a standard by which it's easy for man to judge you. That sin against the law doesn't lead to death. What does that mean? It means when your sin that leads to death is forgiven, grace now has its place. When grace now came, the law eventually started having power. How do I know what the children of Israel were sacrificing against was their sin against the law? Do you understand what I just said? When they bring goat, they bring goat so that they can appease the law. Adam couldn't do anything to save himself because it was completely a, a sin. There was no law. There was no law. All the way until Moses, there wasn't law. Man was guilty as charged. But there was no law. Why? Because God's own standard was simply for man to depend on him. Man fell away from that. That's it. But as man lives together, there are laws created by society. There are laws created as a result of religion. The Jewish law of 613 is different from the law that guided the people that worship on Matala. Doesn't lead to death means those sins does not necessarily separate you from God. If you are ever reconciled back to God, you see, if you, you are completely separated from God, when the children of Israel as sons of Abraham and all of that, they were, they were still completely separated from God. Because the only thing that brings you back to God is the death and the resurrection of Jesus that you believe. And it's so painful to know that after we have received that, we still want to, after Christ has gone to that cross, we still want to stay under the law. I, I like to I like to bring you to an understanding. Uh, if you are a Christian, you have to understand that the law was called the law because it was a standard that man should live by. But that law was to show you your own weakness on how much you need to depend on God. Let's open Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Can we start from verse 20 please? New Living Translation. Sin against the law. So let's look at it this way. God's law was given so that all people could see 
how sinful they were. The moment we took on the Adamic nature, you find it very challenging to understand that you are guilty of the sin of Adam. So God gave you the law to let you know that what your father Adam did, <laughs> you will do also. So when God gave you the law, he gave you that law so that you can see that you don't have the power to keep it. Listen to this. So God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sin more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. After this is the gospel. This is the gospel. This my pastor, my pastoress, this is the gospel. The law was given so that all people, you, you didn't know who Adam was. <laughs> Never saw him, never met him. But you were found guilty of his sin. How can that be? God is not just. Well, he wants to prove to you that he is just. He wants to let you know that if you were that Adam, just exactly what Adam did, you would have done. Here you go. So, so, so he said, but as people sin more and more, God's wonderful grace became more and more. Do you understand? So, verse 21. So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God, resulting in eternal life through Christ Jesus. Come to Romans 7. Uh, uh, the sin with no death is the sin against the law. The sin to death is sin against God. When Jesus told you that some sin, this sin cannot be forgiven, he's telling you that that's a sin against God. But, but when you cross death to life, you still have your Adamic nature. And the law is supposed to let you know that. And so now that the grace of God has appeared to all men, you are supposed to know how to walk in grace. How to live in grace. It's true. I fall short. But thank God for grace that brought me out of death unto life. Let's read verse 7. And I'll read it to verse 8. Well then, am I suggesting that the law of God is sinful? No. Remember he was writing in chapter 5. In verse 20 he was saying the law was given so that man can know how sinful they were. Now he's saying Am I then suggesting that the law of God is sinful? <laughs> he said, of course not. In fact, it was the law that showed me my sin. It was the law that showed me my sin. I would never have known that coveting is wrong. Are you here? I wouldn't have known that coveting is wrong. So, let me break this down a little bit. A little bit. So, Adam, don't eat of this tree. If you eat it, that tree, fruit, the fruit will let you know wrong from right. If he ate it, and he knows wrong from right, and there was nothing that says, this is wrong, and this is right, 
how would it still be a problem? That would not have been a problem. Do you understand what I'm saying? That would not have been a problem. If he read it and he start to know wrong and right, unless somebody now say, if you go over there, it's wrong. If you go over here, it's right. So Paul Apostle is saying, thou shalt not covet. If nobody said thou shalt not covet, I would not even know what coveting means. If somebody says, did not say, thou shalt not sleep with your neighbor's wife. I wouldn't know what sleeping with neighbor's wife really means. I possibly would not recognize the difference between my wife and neighbor's wife. <laughs> but there is this law that allow you to know that when you add the fruit, you, be, you receive a sinful nature. You cannot take sound decision consistently. I understand. You don't look at women. I got that. I know that. I know that. But, but, but. If you read the 613 laws, uh, I'm about, I'm, 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 I'll finish this very soon, but if you, if you read it, Jesus Christ, where do I put them on my notes? I'm trying to look for it. Come find it. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Come find it. I have it on my notes. Oh, Jesus. Uh, okay. I wanted to show you the number that says you cannot, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot take your first fruit, your first fruit, and give it to a stranger. Your pastor that's demanding your first fruit is not your family. He said he's your priest, but he's not from the tribe of Levi. And now he wants you to give him your first fruit because he's trying to look at a particular law that has another contradiction that says you cannot give your first fruit to a stranger. The truth about it is that's what the law does. The law will allow you to know that you can win with the law. So, when you fall short, I still have another three minutes. If you give me another five, three minutes, we will finish this. The law, go back to my Romans 7, right? And let's look at verse 8. But sin use this command, thou shalt not. Sin use the command of thou shalt not to arouse all kinds of covetous desire within me. The moment you tell me thou shalt not covet, you walk over the shield, you kokoro, thou shalt not covet. I'm just not speaking in tongues, and that's Yoruba. That, that, the moment he says thou shalt not, then he started to raise every covetousness in your spirit. If there was no law, sin would have not a power. The sin is talking about here is not the sin that Adam committed. It's talking about the sin of the from the law. So when that writer said there is a sin that leads to death and sin that doesn't, this is what he's talking about. If God has saved you through the blood of his son from Adamic sin and call you his own, how much more would that blood do so much against the law 
in which the men of Israel were using the blood of goat and ram to sacrifice against. When they break the law, they use thick goats and dotted off to atone for their sin. 